On you're welcome back to lunchtime here on News Talk. This is John Kyo. Now, the latest News Talk Nation poll today. Uh, we've decided to focus on health this week. Almost 800 of you have told us how the economic climate has changed your habits when it comes to your health. Joining me for more on this now is News Talk Shona Murray. Uh, perhaps Shona, you to start by taking us through the headline figures from this News Talk Nation survey. Yeah, well, John, as you said, we looked at uh, attitudes to GP visits. Given that the cost of GP visits in Ireland is actually the highest in Europe, well, one of the highest in Europe, and a reduction in the cost of GP visits in the next year is actually part of the agreement that the government has made with the Troika and is actually due to be moved on by the end of this year. So firstly we asked whether GPs uh, offer value for money and um, there was uh, as just to mention there was uh, nine, almost 900 people surveyed on this um, 66% of people said they weren't offered value for money by their GPs which is actually quite a, a huge amount of money. Now this is, something, this is something that arises quite often when discussing GP visits mainly because a person might go and see their GP for something minor like a cold or flu and then only, only spend five to ten minutes with them, which means that they think they're not getting value for money. But a GP would say, well, they still had to do the same amount of training to diagnose something serious as they had to do mm. to diagnose something a little bit more minor. Um, Something else that we looked at was um, whether or not, and this is um, a lot to do with the economic situation we're in now, whether or not people cost prevented people from going to the GP. And 61% of people said that they decided not to go to the doctor because the cost was simply too high. So a little bit dangerous there in terms of protecting people's health. And we also polled areas, for example, um, primary care, pharmacists, should they play a greater role? People yeah. who uh, have or don't have health insurance. What, what, have you, what have you got from those findings? A lot of people um, are, would, uh, would definitely prefer to to trust a pharmacist as a, as a go-between ahead of going to a GP or hospital with something minor. And this has actually changed uh, some, somewhat in the last couple of years. For example, a person can go, can go to a pharmacist for something like the morning after pill now, whereas they used to have to go to a doctor. So uh, people are very much um, in favour of this. 89% of people said they'd particularly prefer to go to a pharmacist ahead of going to a GP because the cost would be much less. So very much in support of that. There are a few recommendations, as I said at the start, um, that the government needs to introduce to reduce the costs of GP visits. In particular, the one would be that um, the government removed the restriction on the GPs that can serve medical card contracts, mm -hmm. which will be which will actually mean that GPs can serve medical card contractors or people of medical cards as well as private patients, which means they may be able to reduce the fee for a private patient, which would be obviously better for us all. And one of the other issues here, of course, is the Memorandum of Understanding. What, what does that tell us well, that, in, 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 in layman's terms? That would be the Memorandum of Understanding, redu yeah. redu removing the restrictions for GPs and also to... But the restrictions explain that. At the moment, it's the case, isn't it, that you can't just willy-nilly set up a right. GP's practice. You have to, uh, you have to um, serve a, a certain locality and um, you can only uh, apply for a medical card to the HSC if a, 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 a GP who has a medical card either retires or dies. So you're basically waiting for somebody to, not to, to, to use it on. anymore, yeah. and which actually takes an awful lot of time. So if that, if that restriction is removed, hopefully the, the, it'll be passed on to your private, your private um, patients. Shona, thanks very much indeed. Now, for more on this and uh, primary care initiatives currently being undertaken uh, by the Department of Health and joined now by the Minister of State, Roisin Shortall, who has uh, responsibility for primary care. Minister, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, John. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you too. Let's go through some of the figures that we have from this News Talk Nation poll then. 66% Minister said that GPs didn't offer value for money and if more GPs were allowed to work within a district... Um, couldn't it be argued surely that the competition alone would lead to lower prices? Well, yes, that argument certainly could be made. I suppose I'd like to start by saying that the fact that I have been appointed by the government uh, as the Minister of State at the Department of Health with responsibility specifically for primary care is a strong statement in itself insofar as the new government very much recognises the importance of primary care. And what we want to see is, you know, serious reform of the health service so that the vast bulk of activity within health, in fact, we're saying about 95% percent of activity within the health service should take place at local community or primary care level um, so that's what the, the reform programme that we've set out for the next number of years. We want to see activity taking place locally we want to see services provided to people mm. at the lowest level of complexity. Well wouldn't Again, it make sense wouldn't it make sense then Minister to um, 
improve value for money by taking away the restriction whereby you cannot set up a practice unless either somebody dies or retires. Well, that's exactly what is going to happen. Um, you know, it, it has, as, as Shona said there, it has been quite difficult for new GPs to set up and practice on their own, um, to set up new practices because of the, the rules that applied and the conditions that had been agreed previously uh, with the IMO. And to that extent, as Shona said, uh, a new person could only set up a practice if uh, an existing GP died mm. or retired. How long is that going to take, was, Minister? That was very restrictive. That work is already underway. The Cabinet have agreed uh, the legislation on that and we would expect to meet the requirement of the EU and IMF in that regard so that by the end of September access has to be opened up. Are you worried at all by, by that figure, 60 odd percent, basically saying they, they've avoided the doctor regardless of whether it's a, a minor um, illness or, or something a little bit more serious, but they're avoiding the doctor simply because they can't afford to shell out because the doctor is costing too much. No, I, I, I'm not surprised at the figure because I'm hearing that all of the time from constituents. And I know that there is a real issue there where people's income is under severe pressure and there's been a lot of demands on people in terms of them losing you know, hours working, losing jobs in some cases, and additional costs involved in just the cost of living. So people are, you know, being very cautious because they simply don't have the money to spare. Mm. And we're concerned about the implications of that for public health, where people, you know, are putting off going to the GP because of the fact that it's, it's not affordable. Well, would, you, would, now, you, would you consider some sort of um, standard fee, Minister? That, that, well, can, you know, can, I, sorry, can I just say to you, the government have very much recognised this issue. We're nearly on our, on, our, on our own within Europe in terms of people having to pay for GP services. Practically everywhere else, GP services are free. And we want to introduce that system in this country. There's a very clear commitment in the programme for government so that over the next four to five years, we will introduce universal free access to GP services. And that's my main task as Minister with responsibility in this area. We're going to move on this in the first year so that we're bringing in people that currently are on the long-term illness scheme that have chronic, serious chronic illnesses. Uh, They will be coming in within the first year. In the second year, people who are on high-tech medicines uh, with serious conditions will be brought in. In the third year, everybody will be subsidised in their their GP fees and in the fourth phase of that we expect that everybody will have access to free GP care. Isn't it isn't it worrying though? I mean, okay, that's that's your plan and that's what you've set out and indeed yes. that, that, that was set out prior to, to the election also and in the programme for government um, and, and we have to obviously wait and see uh, w- w- will that happen. Now though, according to this particular survey, 73.3% of people still have private health insurance. Now that figure was higher. There was I think about 15% said they they can't afford their, their VHI or Quinn or, or whatever health insurance yeah. they have anymore. Yeah. But the, the figure that it's still 73% is quite high. I suppose, isn't that proof that basically people, as it stands, don't have trust, don't have confidence in the health service as it is? Oh, absolutely. And there's no doubt about that. I mean, our, our health service is very dysfunctional. There are several problems at different levels within the health service. And that's why, you know, this government has identified health as an absolute uh, priority for action and for reform. And we intend working on that. As you know, that apart from the initiative that we're taking in relation to primary care, the government is committed to introducing universal health insurance right across the health system. So that, now that can't be introduced overnight, obviously. It's a major reform to the way we deliver health services. And what we're saying is that we're setting out over the next five years to introduce full universal health insurance so that all health services, whether it's in hospitals or at at, uh, primary care level, will be free of charge at the point of access of those services. Now, those services then will be paid for through an insurance-based system. And again, this would be common practice right across Europe. We will we'll, we will hope that in that five-year period, we will introduce a system whereby people who currently have health insurance and who can afford to pay for it themselves will continue to do that. People in the middle will have their insurance subsidised and people at the lower end of the income scale who presently would have um, uh, medical card cover and who will have their insurance paid for them. But who? it will be an insurance-based system. Sure, and who pays for it? 
Well, that's what I've just suggested to you there. Yeah, we're, uh, we're all paying for it, basically. P- people pay for it on the basis of their ability to pay. But, of course, we have to bear in mind there's a huge budget for health at the moment. About £14 billion comes out of taxpayers' money. Yeah, but what I'm trying uh, to go is, under service. the new scheme that you're talking about, um, is that going to lead to more taxes on everybody else to pay for this universal care? What we're saying is that we don't envisage people having to pay more than they currently pay. Uh, in their health insurance, but they will get a very substantially so where, better where, service. So where's, where's the money coming from to, to, to introduce, uh, introduce this scheme? We're reforming the system the way it works at the moment. There is a high level of waste across the, the, uh, the health system. We're aiming to, as I say, have most of the health activity at local level where it's provided to people by their GP, by their practice nurse and their pharmacist. And that's what the public mm. want and your survey bears that out very clearly. Yeah, cause, so, can I just tell you about question four on that survey which basically asked if pharmacists should pay, uh, play rather more of a role in community health care. Uh, 89.5% saying they think that pharmacists should play a greater role. How are you going to develop that? That's huge figure. I mean, almost 90% of people believe pharmacists should have a greater role. That absolutely concurs with my own views on this and with the government's position. Just yesterday, I had discussions with pharmacy interests in this regard. I'm very keen to move towards a situation where pharmacists, community pharmacists would take on uh, new roles in relation to, to primary care services. I would like to start with the flu vaccine. I don't see any reason on earth why the flu vaccine cannot be provided in a more convenient and a more cost-effective way to people through their local community pharmacy. And work is underway on that at the moment. I would very much like to see that happening uh, for the coming winter. I don't know at this point whether it's possible, but that's what okay. I'm working towards. And I would like to see you know, us building on that then in terms of health screening, uh, medicine reviews, and all of that kind of really yeah. important work that pharmacists can do. Okay, Minister, if you can just stay with us for a moment, please. Minister of State of the Department of Health with responsibility for primary care, Roisin Shorthall there. Uh, please stay with us for a moment. I want to bring in Dara O'Loughlin, who's the President of the Irish Pharmacists Union. Dara, good afternoon to you. Um, just what the Minister was saying there about bringing uh, phar- pharmacists more into the fold, taking a, a greater role in community health care. Is, is, is that what you guys want? Can you do it? That's something that we're very much in favour of and that we have been advocating for now for a number of years. We're not looking to reinvent the wheel here. What we've done is we've looked across Europe and across the United States the globe to see what pharmacists are doing elsewhere that we're not facilitated or empowered to do here. And it's all about providing convenient, accessible and cost-effective health care to patients where they want to receive it. So we absolutely welcome the Minister's commitment in that regard and we would endorse her remarks completely. What about what she was saying there, for example, she'd like to see pharmacists uh, um, uh, looking after the flu vaccine in, in particular, just one area, as early as September. Is that something you guys could do? If we were to agree to put plans in place now, it's something we can roll out. At the time of the H1N1 swine flu pandemic, more than 900 pharmacists across Ireland trained at their own expense to administer the swine flu vaccine in case our services were needed. But in the event, our services weren't needed. So we have demonstrated the capacity is there. And one of our major pharmacy chains in this country actually did have its own flu vaccination protocol through last winter, which was extremely successful and it was very, very warmly welcomed by their customers and patients. There are 85 or 89, rather, 0.5% of respondents to this News Talk Nation poll uh, said they wanted to see more primary care teams providing outpatient hospital services in their area. Um, Do you think that's a viable proposal? Would it be cost effective? Yes, it is viable and it is cost effective. That's what patients want. It's what we hear in our pharmacies every day, no more than the minister hears it in her constituency clinic. Our patients don't want to have to travel into hospitals to go to outpatient departments and outpatient clinics. They want to be able to have their chronic diseases managed by their GPs and by their pharmacists because it's more convenient for them in terms of time saving and access and very often it would cost them less money. So in situations such as patients who have diabetes or cardiovascular disease or asthma, those are chronic long-term conditions that can be very effectively and very safely managed at primary care level by pharmacists and by GPs. There's no reason why those patients should have to go into hospital except for the worst exacerbations, 
which, if the diseases were monitored and managed closely, wouldn't occur nearly as often. Let me just go back to Roisin Shortall, the Minister of State there, on, on that particular one. Um, you, you said, Minister, about um, maybe starting with the flu vaccine. What about asthma, diabetes? All of these, if the pharmacists were looking after them, presumably would take pressure off GPs and, in turn, they wouldn't then be referred to hospitals, so it breaks down the, 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 the problem with, with overcrowding in A&E departments. Oh, absolutely. And, I mean, that is exactly the, dire- the direction this government wants to see the health service taking. There's currently a lot of work uh, underway in relation to developing chronic care programmes for people with different chronic illnesses and they will be rolled out from starting from September and the whole idea with those is that we would aim for best practice in terms of managing diabetes or whatever the, the particular illness is that we would, you know, there are issues about us not reaching, reaching best practice in this country and we need to be aiming for best practice and best outcomes on an international basis across all of those chronic illnesses. And the plan is that those care programmes would be put in place and um, the, the emphasis would be on providing care in mm. the community by the GP, by the practice nurse and clearly pharmacists have a key role to play in that area. Sure, but then that's all in long term, so in the short it's, term... Well, it's, it's, not, it's not now in, in fairness, no, John. No, I suppose, no, what, what I'm trying to, if, uh, just allow me to make the point, basically, yeah. if, if we're going, looking at a situation, <clears throat> excuse me, whereby it's what, only two, three weeks away before we're going to face the junior doctor crisis in A&E departments all around the country, we're looking at Roscommon, Port Leash, yeah. Mullingar, just in the last 24 hours or so, they're, they're facing closure from 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening. So this is, this is long term, like we're facing into a, a quite a possible big crisis in the next few weeks alone in A&E departments. Yes, and I don't deny that. And, you know, the reason for that is because of the dysfunction within the health service that has existed for many, many years and has been ignored. What we're determined to do is to introduce reform so that we deliver health services in a different and better and more cost-effective way. And work is underway on those kind, on those reforms that I've just spelled out to you. And we would hope to see results from that in the autumn. Now, you know, we're not going to change the hospital situation overnight and there are serious issues there in relation to the shortage of staff. Uh, work is underway on trying to recruit additional staff and to try, um, I think, in terms of a, a, an important reform that's needed, to restructure the career structure for, for hospital doctors because that's very problematic at the moment and a lot of people who have trained in, in our medical system here um, are very dissatisfied with the lack of job opportunities mm. for them and the kind of career structure that they face. So that needs to be tackled as what? well as the urgent issues. Well, what? And what, Can I just say, John, sure. what has always happened here in relation to the health service and at, from the point of view of political direction there, the urgent has always taken precedence over the important. We're trying to to manage both of those and we're trying to devote a lot of resources including most of my time and a lot of staff in the department to introducing the kind of long term reforms that will make a huge difference. Okay finally Minister and that is as you say long term and you know that's that's going to roll out over, over a period of time but yes. for, for people who may have to visit an A&E department in the coming weeks with the July the 11th crisis looming, have you any words of assurance for them that, that, that might, you know, that the situation in the A and E departments won't be absolutely chronic over the next few weeks. Well, the HSE and the Department of Health have been involved in a recruitment program for hospital doctors, and they have been reasonably successful in that regard. There's the expectation is that we would be able to recruit at least 150 doctors initially, but that it won't be a once-off recruitment, so we will be building up capacity. Yeah, so, so I suppose the, really the what I'm trying, will Port Leash be closed down after 7 o'clock? Will Roscommon be closed after 7 o'clock? Will Mullingar be closed after 7 o'clock? Will Limerick be closed out? Like, is this, is this going to come to a head? There will be some closures, okay? I'm not in a position at this point to say what hospitals will, will have to close for certain times. It depends on the, the recruits that we get in, that 150 people were aiming for that number initially um, and whether they will be prepared to take up posts in those hospitals. There are other reasons why people are not taking up posts in particular hospitals and they need to be addressed too in terms of the work environment that is is available for people in those hospitals. And, you know, there needs to be a, a, a look at the whole management structure in those hospitals and the way in which staff are treated. That is, a you know, an issue that's central to all of this. It's, but I, I we have a lot of legacy issues here in terms of lack of planning for manpower within the health service and that is being managed to the best of our ability at the moment 
we can't give guarantees that that A and E departments will not be, be will will be. We can't give guarantees that those departments will be open around the clock as they have been up to now. There are concerns from HICWA in relation to the standard of care and safety. So that situation is going to be managed very closely. But you're and talking about a shortage of 150 junior doctors. Your colleague, the senior minister James Riley, in Galway this morning said the shortage is is closer to 200 between 250 and 400. Yes, that number is right. That's a shortage. What I said is there are 150 uh, doctors who have expressed an interest in coming here over the coming weeks. So we are facing into a real no, we, we are facing into a real crisis because if we need 400 and there's 150 expressing an interest, so yes. presumably maybe let's say half of them take do, go actually go through. That's 75, and we need 400. I mean, that is going to cause chaos. There are going to be serious shortages. There is no doubt about that. And that's because of the, of the fact that there has been no long-term planning in relation to personnel in the health service. And that needs to be addressed. These are legacy issues. It has come to a head now. And the government intends to manage that situation as, as carefully as possible, putting the, the safety of patients to the absolute fore in this regard and where services need to be closed at certain times overnight, for example, we're doing our utmost to ensure that there are alternatives available and that there are safe options available to people involving, you know, the use, the greater use mm. of the ambulance service and getting people to safe A&E settings. I'm just wondering though, Minister, about about the, the, the practicalities of getting um, those doctors, those junior doctors in because we're, we're, we are recruiting in, in Bangladesh, Pakistan, places like that. Yes. Like visas, can they be can they be They're sorted going to very, be very quickly as well? And there is an acceptance right across the cabinet that there is a crisis situation, a potentially crisis situation here that needs to be dealt with, and any obstacles that are in 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 the way of bringing people in here to keep our A and E departments open will be removed, and that includes things like um, you know the, the, the registration, the need for temporary registration, the need for visas, and so on. All of that work is underway at the moment to make that as smooth running as possible. All right then, Roshan Short on Minister of State at the Department of Health with responsibility for primary care. Many thanks for joining us here on Lunchtime on News, on News Talk. Also, Darrow Lachlan, President of the Irish Pharmacists Union. Sh- Sh- Shona Murray still with me. Um, Shona, just one last question. Um, you're listening to the minister there. Um, she's talking about lifting restrictions um, by, by, by later, later this year. Is that going to result in any impact on services to, to patients? Well, I ho- well, we hope so, because obviously the GPs that don't have the medical card contracts can start serving medical card, people with medical card contracts. About half of all GPs have medical card contracts, so that should impact on the private patients. But just to give you an example, a, do- a doctor in North Dublin between 2009 and 2010 earned 767,000 euro from uh, his medical medical card contract alone and in Donegal one earns 754,000 euros. And are euro. they me- medical card doctors med- only? They don't do any private no, they, patients? No, they would do both. They can do both, both but yeah. I'd say the likelihood is given that colossal amount of money they probably just serve medical card holders. So if that sort of money was uh, sort of equaled and balanced around the rest of the GPs then hopefully the private patients would have, uh, wouldn't be charged as much. Alright then, Sean and Murray, Mary, thanks indeed for joining us here on Lunchtime on News Talk.